Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Gosh, it's so good to see y'all today. You sound great today. And it's great to have our guest, David Noted. Um, so good to have you with us today. And we hope you'll just kind of relax and, and listen and allow the Spirit of God to speak into your life. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever uh, been called out to do something that you felt inadequate to do? That would be all of us, right? Have you ever, ever felt like, you know, I, th I think I'm supposed to do this, or maybe a person or someone, or maybe you've had those spiritual moments where you go, I think God wants me to do this, and I am scared to death. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid, one of the first um, memories I have like that, I was probably 12 years old, and uh, I'm sure other things had happened prior to that, but I was uh, playing football. I was playing Pop Warner football, it was called Pee Wee. I was in that division, Pee Wee football. But when you're 12 years old, and parents, you need to know this, uh, moms uh, for your sons in particular, and, and, and daughters have this too, but um, at 12 years old, every game was the Super Bowl, okay? I mean, I still, guys, you know this, I still remember plays in particular games at that age. And so it's pregame, or we're there getting ready to play. I was a running back, I returned kickoffs, and I was a safety. And uh, the coach comes to me and he says, I'm sure he called me Warren. I said, Warren, uh, you're starting at quarterback today. I was like, Whoa, what? I was like third string quarterback. I'd never played quarterback in my life. <laughs> never. Hardly, and at that level, hardly ever took snaps in practice at quarterback. But what happened was our first string quarterback wasn't in the game. It was about to start. He wasn't there. And our second string quarterback was hurt, so he wasn't going to play. So I'm going, I take the opening kickoff, sure enough, I'm gathering in the huddle. I'm scared. I still remember today, I was scared to death. I can't do this. I don't even know what I'm doing. It was that bad. And right before we're calling, the, calling out the first play of the game, the first string quarterback comes running out on the field. <laughs> I say, like, oh, good. Woo. And I, I remember just in the moment, I was like, oh, good. All is well. All is right in the world. But what happens is oftentimes, not every time does the first string quarterback show up, right? And sometime in life, you are that person, not a coach, but God is saying, yep, you. Because I was truly that way. I was like, well, there's, there's got to be somebody else, right? And, and oftentimes I think we feel in our lives that maybe God is prompting us, but so many of us are here today and fear has taken hold of our hearts in many different ways. We're going to look at that today. But God is calling you out to accomplish his purpose for your life. But when I, even when I say that, there's all kinds of, maybe even fear and tension in our hearts. Like, I, I, don't, I want to, okay, in this context right here, in worship and in the church, I want my life to count. I want to answer God's call on my life. I'm just not sure how to go about doing that. Well, you come to the right place. All right, because that's what we're doing throughout this whole month. We're talking about the Moses model. He serves as a model for how we can hear from God, how we can discern what is it that, that I have on hand, what God's given me, and how do I use it for his purposes. Friends, listen, this is my passion for you. I don't want you to waste your life, and it's possible for you to miss what God has designed for you to do. And today, if you're listening to his spirit, if you stay focused, I believe this message can change your life. I truly believe that. Because what happens if you've already received God's grace, if you're a believer, the next almost, almost like a second salvation experience is when you discover how God's wired you and designed you, placed you in position to accomplish his purpose for your life. And you start to live a life on purpose. There's nothing like it. But here's what happens. A lot of us feel like we're trapped. We feel like, we feel like MacGyver. Anybody? Anybody remember MacGyver? If you're a child of the 80s, early 90s, did you watch this show, MacGyver? If you didn't, you probably still know that MacGyver would find himself locked up in a closet. He was the secret agent man. But he was going after the bad guy, but he'd ultimately find himself. There's one, one scene where uh, he had these zip ties. He's, he's tied behind his back, and he used a coat hanger and a space heater to get out. 
I mean, and that, that was like the episode, right? Every time he's trapped in something, he's got, I got a paper clip, I got some duct tape. He usually had his, his Swiss Army knife. I got a banana <laughs> and some cleaning solution. <laughs> and he makes a bomb or something, right? <laughs> and he gets out or he flies out somehow. But a lot of times, here's what, here's what he would do. MacGyver would take whatever he had on hand, right? And that was the brilliance of the show. Every episode was the same. And he'd somehow get out. But what happens for us is that we, we kind of look around and we go, man, I, all I got, I got a paper clip, you know. Um, I, got, I got a banana. That's, it's, I've got nothing. What am I supposed to do with this? And today I want you to see that God has placed in your hand all that you need to accomplish his purpose for your life. So I want you to turn to uh, Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to look uh, at the call experience that Moses had. This is a real famous story. A lot of you know this story. Even if you don't know the Bible well, um, you might have seen the Ten Commandments you know, on TV from way back. And this is the, the burning bush experience. This is Moses' call, on, uh, or God's call on his life. Now, last week, if you weren't with us, just to catch you up just a bit, in, in the first uh, part of the book of Exodus, um, Moses is drawn out. He's called out, if you will, out of the water. Literally, his name means drawn out. Uh, Mashal is the Hebrew word that means drawn out. He would personify his name. He's drawn out, watch this, to go back in to draw God's people out. This past uh, Christmas, I, um, I, was, I was struck by uh, and, and did this kind of research on, on names. My, my name, uh, each name, my names of, of each person in my family. And so I took the first, middle, or, or now maiden, last name of everybody in our family. And I thought it'd be a really cool thing for me to kind of provide this kind of patriotic blessing on everybody in my family, my wife included. And so I took everybody's name, and, I, and, I, and I'm not a calligrapher, but I, I wrote down each of their names and what each of the names means underneath, and then I wrote a sentence out of, of what I saw in them and how they were living out that name. It was a powerful exercise for me. I was a little skeptical going in because I thought, well, I think my parents just randomly gave me the name Jeffrey, right? Jeffrey means God's peace. And if I'm anything... You know, I'm a, I'm a grace-centered, I, I'm, I'm a grace addict. And what I do so often, I'm a, I'm a mediator, I'm a middle child, okay? And I, and I seek to bring God's peace into the hearts and lives of people. I've said it before, I prob, as a pastor, my number one prayer that people ask me to pray with them is I need peace in my life. Anxiety, worry, and fear. And God's called me out. I think it's an interesting exercise for you to do here at the beginning of this year. What does your name mean? How are you living it out? Moses lived it out. And I think that God has, has placed a name on you to accomplish what he has laid out before you to accomplish. So Moses then, just to catch us up a little bit here, he ends up being drawn out of the water. And then you know the story where he ends up killing this uh, Egyptian. He sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew He's a Hebrew, one of his own. Moses, after he's drawn out, he's adopted into, uh, into Pharaoh's family. Okay, So he's raised in the courts of Pharaoh like an Egyptian of privilege. But he's a Hebrew at heart. That's part of the story too. Moses, you're a Hebrew. That's who you are. And I'm going to use you as a Hebrew. Okay, As a Jew, ultimately, um, is what we would call these people. And, and, and so he ends up killing this uh, Egyptian. And then uh, it's found out. And so he's on the run. For 40 years, he's in the wilderness. And even there, God is using this in his life because ultimately, uh, you can't call others out of the wilderness unless you've been there yourself. And Moses' story even ends up part of his calling. He calls, uh, then uh, God calls to him out of the burning bush in chapter 3. You can see it there in chapter 3, verse 3. I'm going to set this up a little bit. We're going to land at the first part of chapter 4 and really apply this message today. And in chapter 3, uh, verse 3, we noted that he says, I will turn aside to see this great sight. And then it says, I think it's interesting, God, then it says, when God saw that he had turned aside, then he spoke to him. We said last week, the most important thing you can do in 2018 is to turn aside. Are you paying attention to God? And, and, and I applaud you for being here, not to miss a Sunday. Every time we gather, you're hearing God's word preached. No other time in your week is like this. 
priority for the believer. But you can come into God's word every single day and say, Lord, I'm just turning aside. I'm going to bring my attention to the burning bush of your word to speak into my life today. And I'm praying that you will have a burning bush experience today. And so what happens then from that point on, he calls him out. And then I want you to see with me what happens next is what I'm calling, uh, instead of obeying God, Moses just starts beating around the bush. That's all he does. He's going to be beaten around the bush. And I want us to look at the excuses that he has real quick. We're going to buzz through that and then get to the body of the message, which is found in chapter 4, uh, verse 1. So turn there, chapter 4, verse 1. And uh, I want to I read the first, let's go through the first 13 verses. A little longer passage than normal, but I want you to capture the story. I'm going to back up and look at some of the excuses because we find some of them here. Identify with those excuses. And then I want you to see how God has wired you to accomplish his purpose. Watch this. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and watch this, it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. Who wouldn't, right? But the Lord said to Moses, put your hand out and catch it by the tail. Now everybody knows you don't grab a, grab a snake by the tail. So he put out his hand. He, he's obeying him. He caught it and, and it became a staff again. It became a stick again. And watch this. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their, uh, of their fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. They're going to see it because of this. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Now this was terrifying for people. This is a terrifying kind of exhibition here. And then he says, and then God said, put it back inside your cloak. So he put it back inside his, his cloak. And when he took his hand out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. So this incurable disease, here's what's going on. Moses was going to just say, hey, watch this, you know, leper. And people starting to run. He goes, no, 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 I, whoa. You know, and then it comes back out and it's normal again. And, and the people are going to go, okay, wow, what, what is going on here? If they will not believe you. Now, it's almost God is setting up Moses to say, this might happen. Okay, they may not believe the first miracle or the second. So watch this. There's the third one coming. Uh, If they will not believe you, verse 8, God said, or listen uh, to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe either of these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile. Okay, watch this. This is the source of life in this part of the world. And pour it on the ground and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Wow, life becomes blood on the ground, which is death. Verse 10, but Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, not now, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, hey, who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. He says, I'll give you the words to say. Verse 13, after all of this and more, we're going to see verse 13. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Send somebody else. And then the next verse says, And the Lord it just was angry with him. Now listen, this is a story of a man who is haggling with God, right? And up to verse 13, it's a story of a disobedient man. But all of history hinges on what Moses does next. But I want you to see what I think is underneath this story. And then what happens in chapter 4 later on, he does obey. Of course, you know he does decide to go. But it's only as he goes that God starts to unveil the power on his life. 
So I want you to look at this. Let's look at Moses beating around the bush. Now, again, I'm going to bust through these rather quickly and get to the body of the message. But in chapter 3, verse 11, we looked at this a little bit last week. His first excuse was, hey, who am I? I don't think I can do this, is what he's saying. Can you identify with that? Now, this question of who am I, we said last week, is a question of identity. And so we started looking at false identities. Uh, That is to say, I am what I own, a lot of people believe. I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what I think about myself. I am what I plan. And God says, no, 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 no. You are none of those things. The better question is not who am I, but who is God? What God says to Moses, he's saying to you. He's saying, listen, it's not so much about who you are. It's about who I am. And what I can accomplish through you. How about this? He's saying, Moses, listen, you be you. You do you, I'll be me. Okay, I'll do me. And when you bring what little you have to the table and God shows up and he says, I'm going to do great things through your weakness even. Moses is a murderer on the run and he's calling Moses, come out of hiding, your time in the wilderness is over. Friends, listen, some of you here today, your time of hiding is over. And God's calling you out. And even now, keep tracking with me, because you're thinking, I don't know what I'm bringing. I've got nothing. I, I, I just, I, I mean, I've got very little at hand. Moses is saying, listen, you're a Hebrew at the core. I'm not calling you to be something you're not. Watch this. I'm calling you to be exactly who you are. Yeah, but I'm not much. That's the point. You're not much. I am who I am. And I'm going to show myself great. If you'll only obey me. And we're going to unpack how this happens in our lives. The next one is, I may not gain their approval, he's saying. In verse 13, you've got this fear of rejection, right? If the first one is kind of this fear of not being enough, not measuring up, it's a fear, a common fear of failure. This one is a fear of rejection. I'm not in position to make this command or this demand on the people. I have no authority. They're not going to respect me. So he says, what's your name? Verse 13. And God says, I am who I am. I'm the all-sufficient one. I am undefined. I am God. You tell them it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in verse 17, this is really interesting. I promise that I will bring you out. Watch, over and over again, he says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, God says to him. They will listen to your voice, ultimately, verse 18, he says. And yet he has this desire and this need, like all of us, for approval. And for some of you, your need for approval is crushing you. And your anxieties and your worries, fear that you will not be approved by others. You need to know, friends, listen, if you've received Christ, I can't can't just jump past this. You already have all the approval that matters from the only one that matters. And if you live out of that, you talk about true identity. You're totally loved, fully accepted, completely received by the Father. If you're in Christ, because as we sang about earlier, it's his righteousness. He is our righteousness covering us. Christ, our substitute. We find our worth, our value in him. We can take great risk in life because we can risk failure knowing that we're going to ultimately, I'm loved for who I am. Even if I fail at this, I'm going to go for it because I sense God wants me to do this. And then here's another one. I may not be able to perform well in uh, chapter four, verse 10. I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. And God said, you can't hear either. I'm trying. He didn't say I added that, (laughs) but you can't hear what I'm saying is it's not about you. It's about me. And so we're going to, we're going to see here how we can turn our lives over to the Lord and, and be, and live, live risky lives of grace and forgiveness and love because It's ultimately not based on our performance, but he's already done for us. We're free to fail. We're free to risk loving and forgiving others. We're free to enter into situations that might be fearful for us because we know ultimately our identity and who we are is already secured. The final one I want you to see is is that verse 13. I'm I'm not as qualified as others. We've said this in, in this world of, man, social media and And uh, all kinds of Instagram and whatever else we've got going on that, that, uh, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And in our life, and especially for our young people, it's it's constant. And and so he says, send somebody else. Somebody's going to be better than me. 
But here's what happens in the church, and I want to challenge you with this as your pastor. What happens in a church, any volunteer organization, what happens is there are two mythical people in every church. Um, there's somebody and there's someone. And there's a call for the church. Come on, let's step up, let's go. Let's do this. Somebody's going to do it. We think someone will do it. Uh, you know, someone ought to take care of that. Somebody ought to fix that. Because I see a challenge, a problem. If we were to do that, we'd be something. Somebody and someone ought to do that. And one pastor said, well, the busiest guy in the church, nobody. Nobody did it. Nobody's doing it. Nobody did that. Nobody did that. When God is calling every one of us to see what, what is needed and necessary, it, it's what leads to what you've heard, the 20-80 rule. you got 20% of the people doing 80% of the work, right? Or 20% giving 80%. Here's what I've learned as a pastor. 20% who are giving, who are involved, and serving are getting 100% of the blessing. Not the others. Not the rest of us are just showing up and saying, I don't know what I've got to offer. i got nothing. And today, I'm praying, will be a catalytic message for you that'll change your life. So here we go. When you step in and through all of these excuses, I want to ask you, do you relate to them? What are you saying no to in these days? What do you sense God's prompting you to do as the Spirit speaks in your heart, and you've been offering excuse after excuse? And even now, you're going, well, Jeff, I'm telling you, I got legitimate excuses. I'd argue, no, you don't. Especially if God's calling you to do it, I know that you don't. And so I want you to think, what is God calling you to do? This would be the saddest story in the Bible if it weren't for the fact in the latter part of chapter 4, he does indeed decide to obey. So I want you to see, though, in chapter 4, this is the key body of the message here. The key question that turns everything around is the question that God asked, chapter 4, verse 2. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? This is the question I want to ask each of us. What's in your hand? Because what is in his hand, he says, well, it's a staff. I want you to see the staff represents three things. All right? We're going to unpack this a little bit and apply it to our lives. The, the staff represents Moses' uh, identity, all right, first of all. Secondly, it, it represents his income. Thirdly, it represents his influence. All right, so first of all, it represents his identity. All right, so he's a shepherd, right? So, so the staff marks him as a shepherd. That's what he does. That's who he is. And watch this. God is going to call him, again, not to be someone else. He's going to be a shepherd. He's going to go and shepherd God's people out of Egypt. He's going to guide them like herding cats, but he's going to guide them out because he's a shepherd. What's, the, what's your core identity? Again, this is why gospel-centered life and ministry is so important. We, we serve out of who we are in Christ, even. You know, you've heard me say it before, those of you who remember. You know, I, and, and you're tracking with me here thinking this. I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a pastor. I'm a friend. I'm a brother. That's who I am. I'm all those things. But none of those things are the truest thing about me. Because any one of those five things could be taken away from me today. And if you base your worth on something that can be taken away from you, friends, listen, the moment it is taken away, you don't want to live anymore. Because your value and your worth has been wrapped up in that thing. It's why professional athletes often need not just therapy after a career-ending injury. They need mental, soulful therapy. They don't know who they are anymore. And you know story after story, because anytime we place our value or worth on something that can be taken away, listen, listen, something that is other than God himself, Christ himself, we are destined for trouble. So at the core of who we are, we live out of that. And yet God has designed you in certain ways, right? So, so then Moses is, is called out and he says, what do you have in your hand? It, it's your identity. It's your income. Because the staffs he represented his wealth. Think about it. It, it, it represented the fact that his, his, uh, all of his wealth was wrapped up in his livestock. In those days, they, they had no real income, if you will, but they had no bank accounts. They had no IRAs or hedge funds. His investment was in his livestock. So this represented his resources, Right? And, and in terms of his talents and his money, sure enough, for us, it, it's, it's a position that he's been put in. 
what about you? What do you have? And I'm going to help you discern and understand what you have. His influence. Moses used the staff to pull and to poke his, his resource. How about this? He used it to leverage and manage his resources. And so his influence was, was um, represented by his, his staff. You see, there's a, there's a leadership principle here. Leadership is a stewardship. And, 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 and it's temporary. And you're accountable. And God's placed every one of us in positions of influence. That's what leadership is. It's influence. And Moses' staff represented his influence. There's a, there's a, there's a leadership or a, a, of influence, and there's a leadership of affluence. The latter is based on what you have. The former is based on who you are. That is the most powerful influence that you have, and it's how God has wired you, as we'll see here in just a moment. So this simple a moment is a hinge point in history because here's what God is saying. Listen, don't miss this. Here's what happens. What's in your hand? God says, lay it down. Trust me. Give it to me. Watch it come alive. You take it up again. It's a stick. You lay it down. It comes alive. Take it up. It's a stick. Whatever you have in your hand, God's calling you, give it up, lay it down, and watch it come alive. What do you have in your hand? Let's talk about this. I want you to understand that when... See, after this incident, here's what happens. It's no longer the staff. It's called the rod of God. He's going to use this rod uh, to, 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 before the Red Sea as it, as it splits the Red Sea. He's going to hold it up in victory when the people uh, are at war, ultimately, and overcoming the enemies. So what's in your hand? What are you doing with what God's given you? What's in your hand? Let's, let's ask it this way. What's your shape? I want to give you a simple acrostic that's going to help you think through this. Real practical message today. I want to help you. What's God given you? How has he wired you? And again, God was calling Moses not to be somebody else. He was calling him to be him. Because here's the fascinating thing. Some of you know, before we look at this acrostic, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. I want you to catch this. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. Some of you know this verse. And this is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one should boast. All right, Nobody can boast. It's what God's done for us. For we are, are God's workmanship. This, this, this word in the Greek is poema. We get our word poem. You're his poem. You are his artwork. You're his story. See, it, it, it's, it's his story. History is his story, not your story. Moses, is not about you. It's about me. Listen, friend, it's not about you. It's about him and his power being seen in your life. But the thing I want you to see here is this. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Some of you have read that verse before. Maybe you've never seen that. This is mind-blowing. God who stands outside of time knew before you were born who you would be, exactly how you would be wired and designed, and he knew your story, every bit of it. One of the things I did before the holidays, I went on this intensive, personal, guided retreat. And the premise of it was a lot of us know our story. You know your story. You could tell me your story. But very few of us have interpreted our story. And I would challenge you with this at the beginning of this new year, in your own personal quiet time, to think of the highs and lows in your life. Break your life down into certain uh, periods of time. Uh, as a child, maybe there's four or five chapters of your life. Name those chapters. Be creative. Name them. And think about the highs and lows that you've experienced. Maybe very private uh, you know, parts of your story that were devastating for you personally somehow. Or the great moments where... It's something happened and it changed your life. God has wired you. In fact, he has designed you. He knew your story and he knew that he would use it for his purposes. He's using Moses' story. Even the fact that he ends up in, in exile, on the run, God's going to use that in his life. Friends, he never wastes a hurt and he never wastes a moment of suffering in your life. He uses it for his 
glory. And this is what is so amazing to me that he has designed you to do things before you were ever born, before the foundation of the world, he knew that you would do before you die. But it's up to us to say, yes, Lord, what is that? I'm all in. He has shaped you, he's designed you, and he's assigned you for a call in your life. So let me help you break this down. Here's the acrostic that I think is so helpful. The S stands for spiritual gifts, all right? What are, you, what, what are your spiritual gifts? Uh, now, there are things like serving and giving and leadership. Some of you have a great gift of, of giving or prophecy uh, where you can just call truth out. You have a gift of teaching. Uh, and many of us can, can discover what our gifts are. Now, this is Romans 12. You can find it in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, 1 Peter 14. Now listen, there's a, 1 Peter 4, there's an um, online assessment that you can take uh, for, to help you with that and your spiritual gifts. It's on our website. There's other tools, but that's a great one. The H stands for heart. Okay, What are you passionate about? What gets you real excited? What do you love to talk about? Uh, God's wired you that way. Not everybody has your passion. We talked about this last week. Another, uh, another diagnostic question is, what, can you, what is it you can't stand anymore? What makes you crazy? Um, that can lead you, it can inform your calling, all right? A is abilities. This is just natural talents. What, what God-given abilities do you have, all right? That God's given you those abilities to be used for his purposes, not your own. The P is personality, all right? So what's your personality type? Um, what kind of groups do you like to you know, serve with or work with? you like large groups, like a small group, like one-on-one? Are you extrovert? Are you introvert? What's your personality type? And again, there's great tools uh, to help you figure that out. Uh, experience. What experiences have you had that are unique to you, good and bad, right? What's your story? What are you holding in your hand? The Lord's calling you to lay it down and watch it come alive, all right? So here's why we can do this. I want to start to land this, and then I'm going to give you a very practical challenge. We can lay down our lives because Jesus has already laid his down for us. You see, the Bible tells us, the Apostle John says this, By this we know, love, that he, Christ, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the, for the brothers. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. Jesus said this in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. This is exactly what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us, and he calls us to do the same. And we can do so because of the freedom we have in him. We already know who we are. We're forgiven, totally loved. I'm a beloved son of, son of God. That's who I am at the core. That can't change. I can step in to, to challenging spaces and places with, even with fear and say, Lord, I know that you're with me. And I, I'm going to do this thing for you. In fact, in John 10, Jesus said this, no one takes it up from me, but I lay it down. Look at this. He did it on his, on his own accord. He did it by his own will. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from the Father. See, the entire Christian life is laying down your life daily. That's why Jesus said, if you want to follow after me, Luke 9, 23, you're going to, you're going to take up your cross daily. You're going to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. All of the Christian life is laying down your life. It's a paradoxical way to live, but it's the only way to experience uh, the joy and the freedom and, and the power of God on your life. So I'm asking you the question, of course, you've heard it. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? You know, when I think about those that God uses greatly, my mind runs to Martin Luther King Jr. this weekend. He was a man who at 26 years old was a pastor, called out to be a pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He was in Montgomery, Alabama, all of a sudden thrust into national spotlight, international spotlight ultimately. He's 26 years old when Rosa Parks takes a seat on a bus because they said white people sit here and black people don't. She sat down. Rosa, what do you have at hand? I got a seat. Take it. Sit down. Watch what happens. 
Dr. King ends up 27 years old. He's got a newborn baby at home. He's preaching. He's now the president of the Montgomery boycott, bus boycott you know, organization there. And he's preaching in a church. And the front porch of his house is blown off with his new wife and his newborn baby at home. And he comes, he calms the, the storm of people wanting to enter into violence. And God would call out this young 26, 27-year-old to ultimately, ultimately change the world. He says, what do you have? What do you have at hand? God just thrust him in the center, the spotlight of reconciliation, facing injustice in our world. Praise God for Dr. King. But this is what God's always done. He comes to a little shepherd boy named David. I mean, basically, a teenage kid with a garage rock band is what he's got. And he says, I'm going to use you, man. In fact, he says, David, what do you have in your hand? I got five smooth stones. Good. Take down the giant. What do you got? I got a liar. I got a little guitar. Play it to my glory and teach other people how to worship me. And we still read his songs today. Prophet Amos, what have you got? I got a plumb line. Good. Remind the people there's no such thing as relative truth. There's a standard of truth, and you tell them. Okay? Jeremiah, what do you have? I got dirty underwear. All right, good. Tell the people that's what they're like. What? That'll fly. What else you got? I got a jar. Good. Throw it down. Shatter it and tell them if they don't follow me, that is them. All right. I'm in. How about this? Little boy, what do you have? I got five little barley loaves and two fish. Watch this. What do you have at hand? See, God has always taken the normal, seemingly random things and he says, I want you to lay it down. Friends, this week it's going to happen. You're going to have a random moment. What do you have in your hand? I've got a coffee appointment with a good friend. Bam! Use it to my glory. Point them to me. What else you got? i got a little baby at home. Holy smoke, are you kidding me? The greatest thing that you'll do in your life, listen, it may not be something you'll do, but someone you'll raise. You've got something in your hand right now that God's given you. And he's asking you to use it, but it's going to take you to say yes to him. What do you have in your hand? Friends, think hard and long about this. Most of you know it. If you've lived long enough, you know what it is. You know what you do well. You know how God's wired. You just are not saying yes to him. You haven't said yes. You haven't laid it down. No wonder you think it's just a stick. Lay it down before him. Let this be the day that you give him your life. Friends, don't waste your life. We're at the start of this year. And again, in a crowd this size, some of us, likely someone will not make it through 2018. We've got a moment in time to live our lives for him and not waste our lives. Listen, I'm going to close with this. I want you to take this bulletin right here. Would you do that? Just grab it right now. Grab this. Do you have one? Did you get one coming in? If you didn't, take one on the way out. But pu pull it out right now. I'm going to ask you. Here we go. This is how simple this is. What do you have in your hand? I got a piece of paper. Why do we give this to you? Watch this. Wait a minute. Kingdom man, kingdom woman. I saw that on the video. Someone ought to go to that. Somebody probably will go to that. <laughs> Friends, listen. We give you this as opportunities for you, not only to grow in your walk. I was with Dr. Um, Evans this week. I was reminded again, he is an he's an anointed speaker. He's going to be here for a men. His daughter, just as much. You can read the details there. I want you to come. Be here. You can register online. You can come and, and, and you can sign up when you get here. Better to register online for our sake. But you can see that she's going to be upstairs. He's going to be here in the great hall. It's just 6 to 9. We have child care. We're going to be done by 7.45, 8. We'll be out. 
and you can come and be a part of a life-changing experience. Next Sunday morning, you can come. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have all of our women in the sanctuary during this time, all of our men in here. Never done this before. And it's going to be awesome. We're going to worship together as men in here. And you're going to worship together as women. And we're going to, we're going to talk about what it means to be a, be a godly woman, a godly man. And we're going to encourage each other. You have opportunity to invite friends to come. Now, now, Dr. Evans will be in his own church, Oak Cliff Bible Church, on Sunday morning. I'll be here with you in this place. But it, we give you this to say, what do you have in your hand? Listen, it's more than a piece of paper, right? Tonight, we've got a call to prayer. You just look at it. You come and pray and invite others you know. Okay, come with me. Let's do this. Young people, listen. Parents, Disciple Now is coming up. What do you have in your hand? You've got some, something you can take and invite other people to come and be a part of. It's that simple. God is calling you to take what you have at hand and to, and to give it over to his glory. So as I wrap this up, here's, here's the truth. Some of us feel like we're MacGyver. We're stuck in a closet and we can't get out. You know how to get out. I've told you today, you take whatever is at hand. But here's the, here's the thing. You're not MacGyver. God is the cosmic MacGyver. God is the one who has given you all that you have at hand to do all that he's called you to do. Nothing more and nothing less. If you'll lay it down and allow him to make it come alive and you'll see your life be all that he's called you to be and you'll live a life on purpose to his glory. Let's pray together as we close our time. I want to guide you in prayer. We have a moment. We're not going to sing a song. We're just going to pray and then a few more words. But I want you to come before God, the most important time of this morning. He's spoken into your heart. He's calling some of you to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've not done so. And friends, if I could be so bold, you will never live a life on purpose, chasing after the stuff of this world. But when you give your heart to Christ who gave his life for you, you can be totally forgiven. He lived the perfect life for you. He performed perfectly for you. You don't have to perform for God or anybody else. You have the approval of God most high because Christ has bridged the gap through his life, his death on the cross for you. He took on your shame, punishment. There's none that comes to you now. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God will never be mad at you again. Give Him your life right now. Some of you need to follow that kind of decision by joining the church. Today is your day. Friend, if you're not a member of the church, I challenge you. This is your day. Maybe you've been coming for some time. Maybe you're brand new. But you need to act. You need to move. Lay it down. Lay down your life. Some of you need to be baptized. Some of you need to lay down your life in the baptismal waters as a proclamation that you've given your heart to Him. Friend, don't waste your life. Lay down your identity. Lay down your income. Lay down your influence. He's given it to you. All that you have. So Lord, we give you our lives. We pray you'll take it and turn it into something beautiful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, on your, uh, on your way out, I just want to say a couple of things, and then we'll, we'll head out uh, with the benediction. We have a, a journal that you um, receive in the mail, if you had not already. We have them at our Connect Centers as well. What do you have in your hand? You've got an opportunity to see not only what God's doing, but then, again, to read over it and then to pass it on to a friend. Uh, I want to say this. I will be, along with others, right through these doors here. You can go out in the hallway there and find your way over to uh, just a response area where you can come. We can pray for you. If you want to come and join the fellowship of the church, as we've noted already, you can come and do that today. If you want to come for baptism, just come right over here. If you want to come and talk more about what it is to receive Christ, if you need prayer today, just come right over here, uh, and I'll be there along with others, and we gladly welcome you that you might become 
uh, a member of our church as well. So let's all stand together, and I'm going to offer a uh, benedictory uh, blessing and challenge as you go, as you now go to worship the Lord with your life today. It's so good to see you. Praise be to God. And now, may you go. Like Moses, God's little quarterback, who knew he couldn't do what God had called him to do. And yet God is calling you to take what he's given to you, to lay it down. Lay it down. Do not be afraid. Give him your life and watch it come alive in ways you could have never dreamed. Now go in peace and serve him today. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.